There's a story in the canon of a man who's lost his son, his very young son. And he goes every day down to the cemetery and cries out, Where are you, my only son? Where are you, my only son? And one of those days on the way back to home, he stops off to pay respect to the Buddha. And the Buddha asks him, Where have you been? You look like someone out of your mind. And the man explains. And the Buddha says, Yes. Sorrow and lamentation come from those who are dear, those we love. The man says, what do you mean? Those we love give us joy. So he leaves. He runs into a group of gamblers, tells them what the Buddha said, and they, they agree with him that the Buddha is wrong. It's interesting. It's gamblers. Who believe that there's joy that comes from those we love. Because it is a gamble. Every time you have a child, you have no idea what that child's background is, where it's coming from, what your karma connection is with that child. And of course, no matter how good the relationship is, it's going to end. Word of the conversation gets to the king, king of sanity. At that point, he's not a follower of the Buddha. He calls in Malika, his queen, who is a follower of the Buddha. He says, this Buddha of yours, listen to what he said. And she says, well, if he says that, it must be true. Well, he chases her out of the room. Everything your teacher says, you says it must be true. What kind of attitude is that? So she sends a messenger to the Buddha and asks him what he meant. And the Buddha explains how people go out of their minds, out of grief. The husband has lost his wife. He goes wandering from street to street. Have you seen my wife? Have you seen my wife? A wife who's lost her husband does the same thing. He tells of one case where a young woman and a young man have been married, but her relatives are not happy with the marriage, even though the two of them are happy. So they try to lure her away, and they try to marry her off to somebody else. She sends word to her husband, and he, he kills her and kills himself with the idea that they'll be together after death. Who knows where they're going after death? But people do extreme things under the force of love. And the grief that comes when you've lost love. So the messenger comes back to the queen, tells her what the Buddha said. In this case, she doesn't simply repeat the Buddha's words. She goes to the king and asks him, Do you love your other queens? Yes, I do. If they were to die, what would that do to you? And he said, That would change my very life. Do you love your son? Do you love your daughter? Yes, yes. Do you love me? Yes. If something were to happen to me, how would that affect you? It would change my life. And she said, that's what the Buddha meant. So this is the first time when the sanity listens to the Dharma and decides that he actually thinks it's good. We think that interconnectedness is a good thing, but think of all the sorrow that the Buddha saw as he reflected on his many past lives in that first watch of the night. Birth, aging, death, pleasure, pain, death. Eating this, eating that, death, over and over and over again. You think about all the different relationships you've had. Everybody you know has in the past been either your father or has been your father and your mother and your brother and your sister and your son and your daughter. We've been through this so many times. We tend to think that love has meaning. But when there's so many different people, and so much loss, after a while it becomes meaningless. Then we keep going back for more, largely because we don't know how to find happiness inside. It's because of our sense of lack that we go looking for others to fill up the lack. And then when they can't fill it up, we look for somebody else, somebody else, somebody else. Because inner being comes down to inner eating. 
the Buddha says we're defined by the fact that we eat. This is what defines us as beings. It's what we all have in common. And it's our mental feeding that makes us beings to begin with. However, there's a being, there has to be a world in which you'd look for food. And often you find that you're in conflict with others, looking for the same food. Even cases where we take those others as our food. It's this kind of reflection that gave rise to Sangwega in the Buddha's mind. Because the world would be so much better if we didn't have to feed. We would be so much happier if we didn't have to feed. Especially off one another. Think about that world that Kurt Vonnegut imagines in Sirens of Titan. Two of the characters go to the planet Mercury and they discover that the planet Mercury is a honeycomb crystal. One side facing the sun where it's very hot, the other side facing outer space where it's very cold. As a result, the crystal sings. And these little beings called harmoniums who live off the vibrations of the crystal. They're shaped like little kites, little suction cups on each corner. And they crawl around in the crystal and they find a spot where their vibrations are really good. And then they move in. And because that's their food, they're not feeding off of one another. They don't need one another. And they send telepathic messages to one another. The first message is, here I am, here I am, here I am. The second message is, so glad you are, so glad you are, so glad you are. Pure, empathetic joy, both for themselves and for others. Again, because there's no need to feed. It makes you think of the Brahmas. Those who become Brahmas because of the Brahma Baharas. They don't need one another. They're able to generate happiness inside, independently. Of course, even their lives are not totally perfect. They can stay there for a while, and then they fall back down. But it makes you think about Nibbana, when the Buddha says there's no need to feed there, there's no hunger. And there's no nostalgia, there's no regret. Because that's the other part of having relationships, because no matter how much you love one another, there's always regret in one way or another, things you said, things you did. And sometimes that sears itself into your heart. Because you were feeding off the other person. But when you can finally reach a state where there is no need to feed, there's no need to depend on anything, then your compassion can be pure, your empathetic joy. So this is the way out. When we see the suffering that comes from interconnectedness, we realize that the best way would be to pull ourselves out of that. We don't have to be part of that interconnected network. Now You can't just rip yourself out. The Buddha says the path involves generosity. If you don't have a generous mind, you can't get into right concentration and forget about genuine discernment. So generosity is something to, you can do well. This is the kind of interconnectedness that really is good. Instead of feeding, you're giving. It's the opposite. The same with the precepts. There are some grubby ways you could feed, but you decide, no, it's beneath me. In cases where other people are going to take advantage of you, if you hold to the precepts, well, you're willing to give it to them. Let them feed. You can abstain. And with the meditation, you're looking directly inside for your sources of well-being. An important part of the meditation is developing the Brahma Viharas, having goodwill for all, compassion, empathetic, joy, equanimity. You're, you're giving, 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 and you're creating good connections. But not for the sake of connections. It's for the sake of repaying whatever old debts you've got. 
That's how you free yourself. So we can get very sentimental about the idea of interconnectedness, but you have to remember, inner being is inner eating. It's all very unstable, very precarious. When the Buddha taught dependent co-arising, it was to emphasize the fact that we're all independently helping one another. It's that we're dependent on things that can change, and we're dependent on relationships that feed. When the Buddha taught causality to young novices and young novice, female novices, he starts out with the image of feeding. And then you look at dependent co-arising, it's all dependent on this, dependent on that. It's all very precarious, and when it's done in ignorance, it leads to suffering. When it's done with knowledge, it becomes part of the path, and then the whole thing just falls apart. So the Buddha doesn't celebrate interdependence. He does celebrate the fact that you can choose. It's not to be interdependent in a skillful way through your actions, through your thoughts, your words and deeds. But there's also that danger. You can act in skillful ways and then get waylaid, get distracted, get born in a comfortable place, and then forget about the practice. One of the sad things about samsara. It's almost like it's a sick joke. You work really hard to develop good qualities in mind, and then you can get reborn in a good place. And it's sometimes to be so good that you get very lazy and very complacent, very used to having all your wishes met. You can imagine what kind of habits that develops, and then you fall. And John Fuang had a couple of students who were extremely difficult people to please. And one time he mentioned to me, he said, well, there were devas in their previous lifetimes. They're used to having things their way. Now they come back down to earth and discover they have to work for a living again and put up with all kinds of things. They don't have the strength of character to deal with that. So interdependence is not necessarily good. You can make it relatively good by creating connections of good karma. But again, think of that as a gift, as the repayment of a debt. So you become more and more independent inside. Because getting, your, getting out is something we do individually. It's not the case that when the Buddha gained awakening, he pulled a lot of beings with him. And there are other beings who wanted to go there, and that's why I was able to teach them. But they independently had to come to that desire. There has to be something inside you that's independent of others that says, I went out. This may sound selfish, but think of samsara as an addiction. If you're addicted to cocaine, and you want to help other people who are addicted, the best thing to do is get out of your addiction first, get over your addiction. And then you're in a position to help. You know the difficulties involved. You know how you overcame those difficulties. And you can show other people that they can do this too. Now, you can't do it for them, but you can be a good example to show that it is possible. That's the best we can do for one another. So we interconnect through our choices, so make good choices, realizing though that the best choices are the ones where you work on developing your own independent sources of happiness inside, so you don't need to depend on others. You don't need to lean on them. You don't need to feed off of them, and you don't need to suffer and cause the suffering that comes when you make your happiness depend on others. Because when you're in that position, you're creating suffering not only for yourself, but for the people around you. When you learn how to be independent, 
you're not creating any suffering. You're not leaning on others. That's when your goodwill can be pure. Your compassion, your empathetic joy, your equanimity can be pure. It can be all around. It can be universal. Because you yourself are free. 